this is the moment. The Bachelorette is back. Yeah! And the power. I'm gonna fall in love. Is in Jen's hands. And I'm gonna do it my way. ABC Mondays. Everything about her is great. I feel so special. Jen's looking like a queen. My men are very, very hot. Someone call 911. <laughs> you are looking so fire. This is the beginning of a new era. The Bachelorette. All new Mondays, 8, 7 central on ABC and stream on Hulu. Hi, I'm Dr. Lori Watson and the co-host of Foreplay. I'm your co-host, George Fowler, former firefighter, your couple's therapist who loves to talk about sex. Woo, let's discuss everything about the best sexual techniques to building your emotional intimacy, which is really necessary for great sex. We bring sound, concrete tools to reframe your relationship problems and learn how to fall in love again and feel desire. Listen to Foreplay Radio on the iHeart app, on Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, everybody. Welcome. And thank you for listening to this episode of Marriage Therapy Radio. My name is Zach Brittle. I'm here with Laura Heck. We're back. We've both been traveling. Um, We've been kind of all over the place. Uh, I went to New York and Denver and California. And Laura was rock climbing and doing some other stuff. We had to do a couple of one-off episodes. But here we are back together again. And I am really looking forward to picking Laura's brain. I ran into a bunch of therapists in Denver, some of whom described themselves as sex therapists. And it occurred to me, I didn't even really know what they meant when they said that. Laura is a sex therapist, and um, she explains it to us. She talks to us a little bit about what it means and what you would be looking for and how they can help and uh, what wakes her up in the morning and what her passion is. And um, it was really cool just to let her kind of teach me and educate me. So if you've ever had a question of what exactly is a sex therapist, what do they do? How do I how do I pick one out? Then Laura has some insight. This is a very cool conversation. Stick around. Well, Hi. (laughs) <laughs> Welcome back. I had a stand in for you, by the way. I had a stand in for you and she was delightful. She was, <laughs> she, my stand in was also delightful. Yeah. Yeah. Mine was a grown human though. Yours was a child. Yeah. She and was great. Strangely enough, a child could do my job just as well. <laughs> it's what we've discovered. <laughs> I don't know. She needed a little warming up. She was a little shy at the front end, but then I got her talking about teenage slang and she was totally, she, 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 she shined. I should probably go back and listen to that. I, I don't remember what happened. Oh, I started listening to a new podcast about intermittent fasting. Yeah. Have we talked about that on the podcast yeah, before? No. And um, I really appreciate it because I listened to their very first episode. And one of them was like, yeah, I started listening to our first episode just to listen for the quality and make sure it was okay. And, and I got about five minutes in and I was like, yep, that'll do. And that's kind of how I feel. I don't like, uh, I don't like listening to our own voices. I don't like seeing myself on camera. I don't like our social media. Like it is a tough thing to go back and have a mirror pointed at you. And not only that, but somebody recording your voice. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, it's a hard job. Hard job. How was your travels? It was good. I was jet setting. I've never done that before. So I left my house on a Tuesday and I went to New York for a few days. And from New York, I went to Denver for a few days. And from Denver, I went to California for a few days. And then I came home and I was gone for like 12 total days. Yeah. How did you so pack, pack for that? I had, it was hard. Yeah. I had to like kind of think ahead and figure out. And mm-hmm. then like I sent some clothes home from New York with my family. And then I, you know, oh, kind of smart. came down, I, I, I consolidated a little bit more. Yeah. So it worked out in the end. That probably wasn't ideal, but I, I was never underdressed or undressed. So that, that worked out just fine. <laughs> never yeah. underdressed. You were a never nude. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do you, as I'm, I'm actually in the process while I was swimming this morning, I was thinking yeah. about what I'm going to pack because we are also going to be jet setting It's yeah. fresh on my mind because you were traveling last night, husband and I sat side by side in bed with our laptops, which we don't Oof. do very often. Oof. And we booked, I mean, I just saw like the, I, I just heard like the ching, 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 uh-huh. ching. We booked, I think like five separate hotels and maybe four separate flights. Ugh. And that was just the in-between stuff. It wasn't even the main event of our Europe trip. It was like, you fly into London and then you have to go from London to Rome. So you got to get a hotel. Yeah. So we we were doing all that, but we're going to be on the road for, I don't know, I don't even know, 18 days, maybe? Yeah, Long time. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. No, that can't be right. Maybe it's more like two weeks. But when I was thinking about packing, I was thinking about onesies. And I believe they call them romp hymns if it was for you. And for a lady, it's a romper, which okay. is a one piece 
It folds easily. You only need one piece, but like for a man, you have a lot of items to pack. Like you're wearing a fleece and a shirt and pants and shoes. Yeah. 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 I'm just thinking like, how did you think through your packing? Did you create like little capsules where you're oh, like, I'm going to keep no, it in I'm the like navies a, and the blacks? I'm, I'm like, a, I have a little bit of OCD. So I like little, literally marched through like every day. And I was like, okay, this is what I'm going to wear the first day. This is what I'm going to yeah. wear the second day. And the second day I can p- repurpose that. I can go over here. Mm-hmm. I can do, oh, I don't need that because I've already got this from the other. And so I just go through and I do the whole thing. I do it with Reb. When she's trying to pack, she's like, I don't know what to pack. I'm like, let's sit down. What are you going to wear at the airport? What are you going to wear when you get there? And then by the time you get through maybe the third day or so, and you realize how much you have in your suitcase, then you can go, okay, well, I'm going to throw this in or I'm going to take that out. And yeah, it's just a little puzzle. That's the way I think of it. Yeah. But do you start to think through, I mean, I know how you dress, but like, do you think through color schemes where you're kind of like, Mm, I'm just going to start packing. all the same color. It's true. They're all like like these brown earth tones. Yeah. Browns and grains. Yeah. Yeah. Grays. Okay. (laughs) So I'm not trying to create outfits. This is this outfit. I believe they call it a Canadian tuxedo. Denim I'm gonna on stand, denim. I'm going to stand up. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that fun? Yeah. It's a, I bought it. I bought it from a Kardashian. I'm not ashamed to say it. I like good American uh, or good America. Good American, whatever. It's a yeah. onesie. Yeah. Uh, all yeah. jean onesie. It's a romper. It's a romper. Yeah. Okay. Enough about our travel. Yeah. <sighs> So what's happening in your life? Anything new or different? I went to New York. <laughs> 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 I went to New York and I, yeah. uh, I, I, we did that. We had a great trip. We went, uh, we had three full days in the city. We did, we did the bottom half of Manhattan on the first day. We did the top half of Manhattan on the second day. We did the middle and the third day, um, mm, which okay. worked out good for our energy and for our interest in, interests. Yeah. Um, did you eat good food? We ate good food. Um, we ate both Did street food a, and some nice food. Yeah. Street meat. Yeah. Did we, you have a hot uh, dog? I did not have a hot dog. I got out of New York city without a hot dog. Mary did. Hmm. Mary had a couple, but I, I, I deferred to pizza generally if we were on the street and kind of yeah. just getting. Food. What's the style of pizza that like New York is known for? It's, New York is it deep it's dish? really thin crust. You can kind oh, of fold thin. the piece, big old slice, you know, Okay. Uh, deep dish is Chicago. Got it. Okay. Yeah. I, I will have to try both of those. Um, then right. I was in Denver where I did some training with, uh, RLT, Terry which Real. was fantastic. It was really great, great training. Um, yeah. I'm kind of, uh, excited about some of the, those directions. I'm a better therapist this week than I was before I went to Denver, which is cool. Mm-hmm. That's been fun to kind of try out some stuff and, and really apply. Like it's weird when you learn stuff and then you apply learning, it's actually quite, it's actually quite cool. Mm-hmm. And then we went to a wedding. The wedding was the first wedding of a child that we knew. So like I knew this girl when she was four, Rebecca walked her to kindergarten and mm-hmm. here she was getting married on the beach and or on the ocean it wasn't quite the beach, but in, uh, in California. So Rebecca nice. and I were just there and we had a little like three day getaway of our own. Yeah. Punctuated by some wedding events, which was nice. Um, and now I'm back. Okay. And yeah. Well, kind fantastic. Of, yeah. I have nothing fun to report. I am in Ironman training. Yeah. Um, although you're in the I do sloggy to, part, right? Like the, this is like kind uh, of the, the, right. Like where you're just kind of like building your part. base. Yeah. I don't know. It kind of feels rewarding. I, I forgot that. I mean, I've been running all winter preparing for, um, certain different races and I went mm-hmm. to Zion and then I did Eugene and, now I'm integrating outdoor cycling and swimming. So mm-hmm. my body's getting a little bit of a break. And mm-hmm. I have to say, like, I do not want to run. It is not an interest of mine, yeah. but I am yeah. so in love with road biking, cycling. By the way, would you do an STP again? Because I want to do, and listeners, it's it's called a Seattle mm-hmm. to Portland. It's a 200 mile bike ride. Um, and if you have followed along, I attempted a 100 mile bike ride a century in Tucson, Arizona, and I got to oh, about mile, I don't oh, even yeah. remember, 40. Your seat was in the wrong yeah, position. I had to yeah. pull out. Yeah. My seat got tilted up. I didn't know it was a new bike. Um, I thought there was something wrong with the bike itself. And it turns out that the seat was in the wrong position. And um, for cyclists out there, they call that soft tissue damage. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, so I had to pull out of the bike ride at mile 40. So I've never completed anything more than like a 56 mile bike ride. Uh-huh. But would you do an STP? I don't know. I'd have <laughs> to, 
I'd have to transition into a different part of my uh, sort of health and wellness journey. You know, obviously I couldn't do it this summer or I wouldn't do it this summer. Right. But you'd have to train. Would I do it next summer? Like mm-hmm. maybe. Okay. Um, STP is Seattle to Portland. That's what it is. That's yeah. what it stands for. Um, yeah. 200 miles and you can yeah. break it up over two days, which I would, I would, mm-hmm. you know, ride a hundred and then stop camp party, have some alcohol. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> IPAs is the reward. And then hop back on my bike with a very sore saddle and yeah. go at it again. And a hangover. Yeah. <laughs> Not a hangover. I'm getting really good. Actually. It hit me turning 40 this year. It did. I, I hear people say like, Oh, I just can't drink as much as I used to. Cause I always thought 40 year olds were boring. Turns out you really <laughs> just can't like, you know, yeah. after one or two beverages, that's all you got in you before you've wrecked the rest of your day. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of where I'm at. So I learned my lesson and now I drink like a 40 year old. Right on. Yeah. Hey everybody, presumably you're listening to Marriage Therapy Radio because you're interested in connecting with your partner and finding new ways to draw nearer, get to know each other and have cool conversations. Well, I want to tell you again about the Paired app. It's a relationship app for couples. You can download the app and then you pair with your partner every day. It gives you quizzes, questions, games, and fun ways to stay connected and deepen your conversations. This week, for example, there's a whole series around attachment. We did an episode a couple weeks ago about are you avoidant or are you anxious? There's a quiz that helps you kind of suss that out, then begin to explore some ideas about how to have those conversations with one another. Rebecca and I use the Paired app. A lot of my clients use the Paired app. It's really just a fun way to challenge yourself into new and different ways of being in communication. There's a quiz today, for example, called Saying What You Mean. Rebecca and I took the quiz. We got some insight into which one of us is more direct. You'll never imagine which one of us is a little more... um, roundabout and what each of us may need to do to become more direct and more clear in our communication. So whether you're just a few dates in or you've been together for a really long time, try lightening the mood and having fun with your partner by using Paired. Head to Paired.com slash MTR. You'll get a seven day free trial and 25% off if you sign up for a subscription. Just head to Paired.com. That's P-A-I-R-E-D.com slash MTR to sign up today. Connect with your partner every day using Paired. A happier relationship starts here. What has been kind of on your mind? What are you seeing? What's coming up? Like, I'm, I always love talking to you after you've done some training or after we've done a yeah. workshop because a lot gets stirred up and we get yeah. excited about it. It's a fine question. I don't actually know if I'm co- quite ready to talk about it. Like, I I've, I've literally have not had any time to really process it. I, I got mm-hmm. on a plane the next morning, went to California, kind of committed to just detoxing from or yeah. detaching from things that were thoughtful. And then I got home and and immediately went to work and just kind of haven't done it. I think um, I will have plenty to say about it, but probably maybe next week. Um, Mm. I have a question for you, though, that I've been that that came up for me in Denver that I that I'd like to poke around with you on. Interesting. Okay, Can I ask you that. Yeah. Kind of nervous. So, okay, So for context, when I went to Denver, I was going to um, train on what they call the relationship boot camp. So at the end, because I passed, that's the end of that's the, I won't bury the lead. I passed. I did it. I, I accomplished Oof. the thing I was supposed to do, which means I'm now uh, qualified or certified to teach this boot camp, which I think is going to be like really cool. I'm excited. To, I'm excited to lean into it. I have some, I have some thinking to do about like how I want to pull it off, but I'm there with 65 other therapists from all over the country. Mm. And they are all in different phases of their practice. Some of them are coaches. Some of them are psychiatrists. So Um, you don't need to be like a licensed therapist in order to offer the boot camp. You don't. You have to achieve a certain degree of training in RLT and you have Uh to pass this this specific training around the boot camp. But you don't have to be a certified, you don't have to be a a licensed therapist. No. Okay. Got it. Um, and there are people from Canada, there are people from Belgium. So it's, it's more of an, uh, you know, they, they're disconnected a little bit from state licensure as the primary oh. lens of criteria. Okay. Got it. I was in this group, a subgroup of, so there's 65 of us. I was in a subgroup of about eight, um, that we spent the week together and we were all sort of accountable to doing the kind of doing the presentation and, and, and kind of uh, vetting it together. Anyway, I heard more than a few people say I'm a sex therapist mm. and I was like, Laura's a sex therapist. Um, but I don't even know like what that means. Like, yeah. what does it mean to you to be a yeah. sex therapist? Like what exactly is sex therapy? So I'm a, I'm Joe Schmo client. Right. 
and I call you up, Laura, and I'm like, hey, yeah. I'm looking for a sex therapist. Yeah. I want to know, like, I, I realize I it's, just have never really kind of leaned into that with you. Like you finished the process and, and uh -huh. I, and I, and I knew there was an area of interest for you, but how mm -hmm. does it, how does it differentiate for you from yeah. being a couples therapist or like t walk me through it a little bit, yeah. walk us through it. Okay. So the whole idea of when somebody says I'm a sex therapist, it doesn't actually mean that they have gone through any kind of credentialing licensure or specific training related to sex therapy. Okay. You can call yourself a sex therapist the same way. It's also very broad. So um, that's one thing that I would say is like, okay, so you call yourself a sex therapist. What they're really saying is I will and am willing to talk to you about sexual issues of any okay. sort. Um, but it doesn't actually mean anything when it comes to credentialing. So I, I would dig a little bit deeper and the kind of gold standard when it comes to, okay, so you're a sex therapist, but what does that actually mean as far as like what you've gone through in order to be trained Okay, means that they've gone through the, either an ASECT certified therapist. That's so ASECT is the, uh, American, yeah, and I should probably know this. I bet S starts for, stands for sex. Probably. Or oh, sexuality, education. Yeah. Therapist, coach. Um, we're, we'll, we'll look it up with ASEC certified. I got you. I'm looking it up right now. Thank you. Phew. Yeah. Um, but that's the credentialing that I went through. And that's, that's like the gold standard. It's like if somebody says I'm a couples therapist, what does that actually mean? If you're looking for somebody who's specializing it's a good idea to say, are you a certified Gottman therapist? Do you have, right you know, are you an R RLT therapist? Like what okay. kind of credentialing have you gone through? Okay. You've got ASECT. ASECT is A-A-S-E-C-T. So it's the yes. American Association yep. of Sexuality Educators, Counselors, and Therapists. That's right. And there's, there's sort of different tiers that you can go through as far as training. If you're not a therapist, but you're, you want to become a, like a sexuality educator, you can mm -hmm. go that route or a sexuality co coach or a therapist. So I believe therapist. And then beyond that, you can become a supervisor. Um, so when someone says that there's a sex therapist, that really doesn't mean that they have any spe special training or credentialing. They're just kind of throwing out an umbrella term. Like I'm a couple therapist. Um, Unless and so, until they say I'm a sex therapist, I'm a certified asect. Exactly. Or a sex, exactly. sex therapist, you know? Yeah. So Which, if you're going to, this is you, you have this certification. I remember. Well, let's, let's just say that I have not turned my paperwork in yet. Oh. That's, I know every time I go to my consultation group with a bunch of peers, yeah. uh, I tell them, you know, what's going on in my life. And they're like, oh, you wrote a book. That's so great. And you went, you went through the training to become a sex therapist. That's so great. And I said, well, yeah, I just haven't turned my paperwork in. <laughs> Um, so the process is extensive though. It's a couple years of schooling. And then beyond that, you're working with your, you're actually in practice doing sex therapy. Uh -huh. And then you're also working for the two years with a supervisor and you're going over your caseload and they're pointing out sort of blind spots, how to support you. Um, so, okay. That was that you wanted to know about when people That's say the they're onboarding. a sex therapist. Okay. That's the onboarding. Yeah. Okay. But I'm Joe Schmo and I call you up and I'm like, Hey, Lord Heck, I heard you're a sex yeah. therapist. I'd like to get some sex therapy. <laughs> what, you know, yeah. how do you well, orient that? Or how do you, how do you vet that? Like, or how, how do you, how do you help me decide whether or not that's actually what I'm looking for? Well, you just start asking questions. It's the same way that when somebody says I have relationship issues, you start asking questions. You want to understand like, what, what are you experiencing that might be causing you pain or discomfort or frustration? Um, uh. What is it that you want to be better? And, um, and it's a very broad field, incredibly mm -hmm. broad. In fact, I was like the narrowest scope when I was in sex therapy school, mm -hmm. I felt like I had a very narrow lens in which I treat. And mostly what I'm treating are couples that are looking to enhance their intimacy, mm -hmm. but you have folks that are dealing with, uh, you know, different dysfunctions. You have folks that are dealing with trauma, sexual trauma. I mean, it's a very broad field. So, um, same thing goes that when somebody wants a sex therapist, you really are looking for a specialist. What is it specifically that you're wanting to work mm. on? And also, I mean, if you're, if you want like a, a kink, um, affirming therapist, look for a kink affirming therapist. If you are wanting someone that specializes in LGBTQ plus, 
um, look for that. So it's a, it's a very broad field. So look for the certifications and then also look for the specialties. <laughs> yeah. What questions do you begin to ask me? I mean, it sounds like you are focused a little bit on standard marital dysfunction or displeasure or disinterest. Yeah. Um, I tend so, to but not. Where do you go? Like, how do you, what jazz, what wakes you up? Like, what are you, like, what would you do if this inquiry comes in from me, Joe Schmo? Yeah. Well, I mean, when couples come to me, they are almost never, actually, I got this question from a girlfriend. People who come to me are almost never coming to me specific because something's going on in the relationship or something's going on in their sex life that they don't like. It's almost always there's this going on in the relationship, this going on in the relationship. And also as a part of the relationship is our, you know, our intimacy. And uh -huh. part of the intimacy is maybe intercourse that is painful or intercourse that's not pleasing, or we have totally out of whack sexual desires. Like one person is a high, high desire partner. Um, so I'm asking them a lot of questions about the relationship, about their friendship, uh, the history. I love going into sex history, by the way, it yeah. gives so much information. Enough. And the question that I ask, and I, I don't know how I framed it, but it's meant to be very broad and almost a little confusing and abstract. Yeah. But I ask people like Zach, I would say, tell me about your sexuality. And mm -hmm. most people think that what I'm asking them is, I'm do a you prefer? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Right. But I'm really kind of asking, like, tell me about how you came to awareness of your sexuality. Uh, like, what messages were did you receive when you were growing up? How do you experience pleasure? What turns you on? Um, what turns you off? So a lot of these one-on-one -on -one questions are super fun for me to have. And maybe by the time somebody has identified that sex therapy is what they're looking for, they yeah. are ready and wanting to answer those questions as though there's, there's information for them in there that they haven't, you know, submitted themselves to, you know, investigating or being, having anyone be curious about. Yeah. Not only that, but they haven't had those conversations with their partners. Mm -hmm. So it just kind of depending on, you know, if a couple approaches me, I have to feel it out and get a little information about the relationship and the dynamic, their intimacy dynamic in order to discern whether or not it makes sense to have those individual interviews with them where I get a sex history. Mm -hmm. But for some couples, it makes a lot of sense for them to share their sex histories in the same room with each other so that I'm asking questions that they've never asked of their mm -hmm. partner. Mm -hmm. I, I can't tell you, it always kind of blows me away when I hear that people have no idea what their partner's sexual past look like. Huh. What they don't know about previous girlfriends. They don't know about how many partners they had. They don't know when their partner lost their virginity. I'm like, how do you not know this information? Mm -hmm. It's kind of mm -hmm. mind boggling. If I had a couple of bigger takeaways from this RLT training, it would be the, that the power sometimes in therapy. So, okay. So the Gottman method, for example, is very clear about it being dyadic. It's very much about learning how to teach the couple to talk to each other, talk to Correct. one another. Yeah. Um, RLT is a little bit different in, in, in the terms of what you just said, which is there's, there's this, uh, sort of witnessing element. So like I would talk to the client or I talk to the mm -hmm. male mm -hmm. and the value is in her observation, her, right. her seeing, you know, him explore or think out loud about things or having yep. someone deftly go in and uh, sort of move around inside their story yep. so that she in the heterosexual relationship gets, gets an opportunity to kind of witness mm -hmm. the, the work. And maybe there is, I mean, I, can, I, I think there definitely is something different, something powerful about watching your partner, you know, peel layers back uh, in ways that are discovery oriented for you mm -hmm. Um you know, while you don't really have a role other than just to gain empathy and understanding. And that sounds right. like the angle that you have found yourself taking or, or would find yourself taking with clients who are coming in and talking about some of these things for the first time. Yeah. And, you know, oftentimes I will just get them started. I'll start. And I did this yesterday where I was working with a couple and, um, and I had said, okay, uh, like she, she's uh, experiencing triggers. We talked about triggers in a previous episode where, mm -hmm. um, his, he's getting very confused. He's like, I don't understand where these emotions are coming from. They seem disproportionate to the experience that's going on. That's generally, 
you know, a good indicator that maybe your partner is triggered. They're bringing in an old familiar feeling and experience from their past. So I asked her to, I said, you know what, you guys have probably, probably already talked about this, but I want to understand where this familiar feeling comes from. So when in your past or how long have you had this familiar feeling uh, come up? And so she started to talk about it and I turned toward her and I started asking her questions and yes, he's witnessing and I am kind of watching him as he's observing her share her traumatic past. Um, But then eventually I say, okay, now I want for you to turn toward her and to ask her some questions. So I pass the torch to him. So there is definitely an observation. There's, there's a, a witnessing that is occurring But what I'm trying to do is create that safe space for the two of them so that they can actually get curious about each other. Uh And then I'll ask, you know, what questions do you have for her in the same vein where you can try and sort of non-judgmentally try and understand her history and her past so that you can seek to understand and build that empathy up. And he did an awesome job, but we, we, for whatever reason, don't feel safe, feel like it's maybe too deep of a question. It's not the right time and space, whatever it might be, or like that kind of depth of question is off limits. And if I just kick it off and I'm like, Hey, tell me about your first, you know, sexual experience with yourself. When did you, when did you first masturbate? And you can just see like their eyes like bug out uh, or, uh-huh. you know, when you masturbate, what kinds of things do you think about or what turns you on or what parts of your body do you touch? These are questions that partners never ask each other. And so when I open the door and start asking those questions, suddenly it makes it safe for them to ask the same questions that they maybe thought were off limits. Hmm. Yeah. All right. So let's say I'm a skeptic and I'm like, yeah, 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 fine. Like it's all fine and good. I, I, the story makes the sense, but the bottom line is uh, we can't have sex because it hurts her yeah. or because I can't, because I'm coming too fast. Like, if it's, if we're shifting and like, let's just say, well, I'll just do it like that. I'm not interested in the story part. Yeah. The story, we know the story part, but how, what do I do about my parts, my actual parts, yeah. you know, yeah. what does sex therapy have or what does sex therapy offer in, in that space? Or what do you find yourself? I mean, I like to ask a lot of questions if it comes down to like pain, um, then just asking about that pain and Mm -hmm. trying to discern. And you always want to rule out anytime somebody says that it's uncomfortable or there's pain. I'm like, what? let's go to the doctor. I'm not a doctor. Mm -hmm. I can't take a look in your vagina right now. I have no Mm -hmm. idea what's going on, but you can give me some sort of symptoms and I can say, well, let's just rule this out and figure out if maybe your estrogen levels are so low that Mm -hmm. right now you have paper thin, dry vaginal um, skin and it's really painful when you have sex. So let's go check that out. So, I mean, that's one thing that I will do. We also work a lot with physical therapists, like, um, what am I trying to say? Pelvic floor therapists. Yeah. No, that's an interesting, that's interesting because, you know, this, these are the kinds of questions that came up for me last week, just kind of, um, in some different arenas for different reasons. But like, it seems like, sex therapy is really about getting underneath the kind of the stories or the narratives that are informing your sexual history or sexual patterns or sexual life and responsible sex therapy sounds sex therapy sounds like it needs to be in collaboration with a medical provider or a, totally. someone who is like understands actual biology. And I would mm-hmm. imagine that I would imagine there's actual bio. I mean, that's one thing I really appreciate about Emily's work. Emily's book, the first one especially, is really about most women, for example, don't even know how their parts work. They've never mm-hmm. they've never been trained or invited to actually look and go, oh, yeah. look at these this inner labia, look at this outer labia, look at this piece of the puzzle. Like there's yeah. these are the, you know, and so men, simple machines, we all kind of can go, yep, this is how it works, you know, and then, <laughs> um, but there's there's a there's a psychology, I suppose, and a physiology as well. And Mm -hmm. it seems to me like, like good sex therapy would be integrative or at least collaborative in that space. Totally. I I consider myself like a quarterback that people come Mm. to me and they basically say like, Hey, I'm in this relationship. Our intimacy is out of whack. Mm -hmm. We think about our intimacy with regard to intercourse and I come in in and I'm like, okay, I've got my relationship lens going on here. And I'm looking at intimacy and a whole lot of other aspects, not just intercourse, but Mm -hmm. then I'm also quarterbacking 
getting, you know, figuring out what kind of meds are you on and how is that impacting you? And I'm not the specialist, but I'm going to talk to your psychiatrist or your primary care physician and figuring out the impact that those meds are having on your sex life. But then I'm also going to, you know, maybe like collaborate with your pelvic floor therapist or collaborate with your trauma therapist that you're doing EMDR to work on previous trauma there. It's sex is so much more complicated than people think it is. They think Mm -hmm. it is just putting it in and having a couple of thrusts. And it turns out that it is just so much more complicated to have safety and pleasure at the same time. And when those Uh. things get out of whack, then I get to quarterback all of the, like you said, the integrative pieces that make for really successful, long lasting, totally pleasurable experience. Mm -hmm. Do you know, do you know why you care about this? Like, why did this become an area of interest for you? Hmm. I don't know. I mean, you, I, didn't, you didn't specialize in EMDR or RLT or no, eating disorders. You said, Hey, I want to, this is the space. This is the place that I want to get. I wanted um, to be a sex therapist before I wanted to be a couples therapist. And oof. it started, I remember probably being about like a sophomore in high school. And, um, I found, I was Um, how could I put this? Like I didn't date guys, lost my virginity when I was 20. So I was, I don't know. I just found that I liked talking about sex and I liked the concept and I just thought it was interesting and maybe because it was taboo and I like to talk about it like a little bit of a taboo topic. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't actually know why I always felt like it was really important and I think because it was taboo and that I found that people had a hard time navigating around it. I wanted to put people at ease and huh. it was from a very early age. Yeah. One of the things that was just so like it, just a couple of the conversations we got in is just how easy some of these conversations were for some of the therapists I was talking to. Yes. Just like how exactly that they just kind of very matter of frankly, you know, matter of frankly, right. Matter, matter of fact. factly, there we go. <laughs> very much a, like just sort of matter of fact, just talking about sex mm-hmm. and their and their work with clients and and kind of demystifying and destigmatizing. I think yep. a lot of um, where people get hung up around sex, particularly for like those of us who are like me, who grew up in this like hyper evangelical culture where sex mm. was this like absolutely off limits thing until the minute you got married, and then it was supposed to be the greatest thing that ever happened to you, yeah. and this this like whiplash that you have to do to kind of go from demonizing sex or sexual pleasure, or sexual identity to fully embracing it and, and having it be part of your submissive, you know, mutual submission toward one another. Mm. There's a ton of psychology there just for shits and giggles. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it just, I think that there, I think there's a powerful, powerful need in therapeutic circles or in the world to yeah. take this topic out of the taboo realm and put it in the sort of in the public discourse in a way that, you know, which by the way, like this is, uh, I I knew I was going to talk about this, but I started rewatching sex in the city and, Mm. um, and it, it's sort of mind blowing, like sex Mm. in the city did so many incredible things when it first came out. And I have just found just by watching sex in the city, I've moved on from Grace anatomy. So now I'm just watching (laughs) reruns of that. But a couple of things are happening in that I'm noticing, wow, they're having conversations about anal sex. They're having conversations about abortion. They're having conversations. Mm-hmm. I mean, they like sex in the city was, I wouldn't say like bef- bef- ahead of the time, but it's kind of amazing that 20 years ago, mm-hmm. this probably was one of the most shocking things. Well, it was ahead of its time. I mean, yeah. It was, but you know, it's pretty, it's awesome. And I also noticed this is like a little side note that probably you don't need to know, but Emily Nagoski talks about sexually relevant information Uh, that we have like this cognitive dissonance that happens where we're living our lives and we're in this like non-sexual bubble. And then all of a sudden our partner's like, Hey, I want to have sex with you. And there's like this dissonance. uh, And what I'm noticing is because I've started watching sex in the city, just kind of like, while I'm putting on my makeup and then maybe I'm like folding the laundry. 
I have this infusion of sexually relevant information into mm. my daily life. Mm. And I've had way more sex in the last week and a half than mm. I've had in like four months. Mm. And I honestly think it's just because it's been more a part of like who I am mm. on a daily basis, which is a little bit of like why I talk about how powerful Dipsy is as like mm -hmm. an audio book that you listen to, it's just kind of infusing you with sexually relevant information mm -hmm. so that there isn't such a gap to fill in that cognitive distance. Yeah. That's actually really intriguing. I don't think I've ever thought about it like that before mm. where, um, where if you're, if you are protecting your, the, the opposite, right. If you're protecting yourself from sexuality or from sexually relevant information, or if you're, you know, if you're actively, you know, numbing it or dumbing it down, the work you have to do to get to intercourse is that much more. It's, yeah. you have to go that much further. Yeah. Um, and you know, sex in the city is a, is a culturally accepted rather, rather benign version of what pornography sure. also is for a lot of people, which is yeah. this kind of, you know, sketchy, morally ambiguous, you know, potentially dangerous kind of, you know, area, but that's, but a, there's, there's so many other things. I mean, you could choose to put on a sexy pair of panties that mm -hmm. are matching, right? Mm -hmm. Bra and underwear that you only wear on date night and you decided to put it on Tuesday or night. Or frankly, that only you know about. Exactly. Nobody yeah. needs to know about it. And it's yeah. kind of the same thing of like, you know, if you're a man and you enjoy wearing lacy thong underwear and so you go and you pull and that turns you on and it's like kind of revving your engine during the day. Then you're putting, you know, your wife's mm. lacy thong underwear on. And so now all of a sudden you're kind of revved up and you've got that sexually mm. relevant information. Um, but there's a lot of things that we can do. Even just simple things like painting your toenails might make you mm. feel sexy. Um, and it might just turn you on enough where it's just you're aware of it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting my toenails painted today because I'm due you, for a pedicure. What color are you going to do? Clear? I'm in my clear season now. Okay. Because I'm wearing flip flops a lot, so... And yeah. I, I don't, I'm not really a, not a color guy, not, not in the summer. Yeah. Okay. I need to so. redo my son's nails. He, um, yeah, <laughs> his nail polish is probably in his nose because he woke up the other day and with a bloody nose and we realized that he just picks his nose in the middle of the night. So that's hot. <laughs> yeah. that's hot. For those of you looking for sexually relevant information, you can that's imagine a, Seven That's year old picking their bloody nose. That's right. That is the <laughs> gap that I have to <laughs> breach with my sex in the city. Uh, thanks for asking about sex therapy. I haven't been thinking about it for a while. Maybe you can encourage me to turn my paperwork in because I have been I can do that. fully yeah. done for a, probably about a year now. Why haven't you turned it in? Well, I mean, because, because when I went to school to become a certified asect therapist, I wasn't going because I wanted to attract people to my practice mm. just for sex therapy. I just wanted to understand how I could better okay. support couples when they're coming because it is always a part of conversation. Okay. And I have to say, I'm pretty, I'm pretty shocked that there are couples therapists out there that never talk about intimacy and intercourse yeah. and sex and pleasure. Yeah. Um, that kind of blows my mind. So okay. I just wanted to learn but how also, to support. Why haven't you turned your paperwork in? Because I am lazy and I have undiagnosed ADD. Okay. So how can I help? <laughs> when do you need to turn it in by? The end of uh, May? Yeah, let's get my paperwork turned in by the end of May. Yeah. Before I go on my, my tour to Europe. Right on. That's 20 days. I can totally do that. Woof. Okay. I've got to pull some strings because there's people out there that have to do things for me. Okay. In order to right make on. that happen. Am I one hey. of those people? Uh, yeah, actually, I think you might need to write a paper on my behalf. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Please and thank you. Um, all right, let's go ahead and land this plane. And, yeah. uh, thanks for asking about my, my passion. Yeah, right on. I'm happy to learn about it. Like, like I said, it was sort of like a new, uh, sort of aha experience of being around people who really did identify as a sex therapist. Cool. And I went, oh, I need to learn huh. more about that. So thanks for making me smarter. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Marriage Therapy Radio. Um, and thank you to Zach. Thanks for asking about, about my passion as a sex therapist. Um, if you're interested actually in joining either Zach or myself in private practice, you can find out all about Zach by going to his website. It's ZachBrittle.com. And my website is LauraHeckTherapy.com. And see if, it, if it's a good fit for working with either of us. 
Thanks for all of your time and attention, making your relationship better today than it was yesterday. Yesterday.